Hello, we're in the deep freeze. We're going to finish chapter three here with this short little lecture. We've only got a few slides to go. I am going to cover a couple of them again because between and in are important in that between is what you use when you're comparing strings. It's actually better to say is it between this range and that range rather than it, is it equal to something because a lot of times you know where your data sort of is, but you don't know exactly what it is. Uh, you might know it when you're doing a specific, specific query, but business has changed. People are adding stuff. Between and in are good ones. You actually use in on the where clause quite a bit in the next chapter, especially. So pay close attention to that one and make sure you know the syntax for that. Remember, we're always starting with select from where and use an order by to sort on the end. All right, one thing I wanted to remember, ah, remind you of from last time, whenever you use get date, uh, get date returns a date and a time, and it defaults to 12 midnight. A lot of times this doesn't bother you because you'll create a date time field, but you always just put a date in it, so it's going to default to midnight. But in some businesses, especially high-speed transaction businesses like Visa, Chase, uh, QT, you know, it's going to put in the time, minute, second, sometimes even the millisecond. And that can become a part, important part of your query. So you're not going to be looking for exact dates. You're going to be looking from uh, 2020, January 1st, 12 midnight, 00000, to January 31st, 11.59.59.99.99. So you're going to be looking between those dates. Or you're going to have to use functions to truncate it and just look for dates. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, you can use wildcards. All right. And these patterns, we talked about this last time. I just want to make sure you got it in your head that the percent sign is basically to the end of the line. Percent sign is starting with some characters and then the end of the line. The underscore is a single character. Uh, especially if you don't know spellings or uh, this works a lot with stuff like stock numbers where there may be only one difference. In other words, uh, let's say all of our stock numbers are 10 digits and the fourth digits a four if it's a battery. Well, you know, we could say we don't really care about all the rest. We could say underscore, 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 four, underscore, 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 up to 10. Search for that. We're going to find just the batteries. So that underscore is going to replace everything. And just put just one character. And then again, we've also got the E and O. Anything in square brackets is assumed to be one character. So we're looking for Damien with an E or an O in it. Here's some more where you're using the ranges. A through J. Starts with an N. Second character is A through J. Starts with an N. Not K through Y. These two are going to return exactly the same results. This top one's easier to read. And then again, down here. Starts with a 1 through a 9. We don't care what's on the end. Take it all the way to the end. So you can combine these characters and use them to, to search for a range of values. Not null. This is where we stopped last time. Null is a value that, again, that gets created when the field is, has not been used. And remember when we were creating our fields, and we talked about that in Chapter 2, most of the time we require data, but sometimes, for a business reason, we won't require data. We will allow it to be empty, like a payment date. And we know that if it's null, that they've never paid us. So it starts to assign business uses, uses at the table level for null, and that can become kind of important as we move forward. If you load the examples.sql, and that's one of the ones that comes with the AP database, it has a bunch of really screwed up data in it, uh, which is fun to play with sometimes. Sometimes Moroccan chapters will throw in you know, the examples.sql, like this one. There's a table called null sample, and it has a bunch of fields in it that are null. All right. So in this case, he's trying to find very specific rows, invoice totals equal to zero, or invoice totals not equal to zero. You can see how those are coded. And then he's looking for nulls. 
because not equal to zero or equal to zero, those are real values that somebody's put in there. This invoice total on invoice ID number three has never been entered and it was allowed to be blank. So it's null. In this case, the one on the bottom, we're looking for all the invoice totals that are not null. That's going to give us all of our zeros, all of our non-zeros, but no nulls. Notice which one's missing. One, two, three, four, five. Let's go back a slide. And we're searching for zero, we get two and five. We're searching for invoice total greater, not equal to zero, we get one and four. Search for null, we get three. Not null gives us everything but three. Notice we're looking at the row numbers and invoice IDs. They happen to be the same. Okay. The good thing about the order by, the only thing we've done so far is just use order by a field. And that always, the default value is ascending. But you can also do it descending. If you want it ascending, you don't have to type it. But if you want it to go from largest to smallest, that's descending. You're going to have to type order by whatever you want, order by vendor name, space, DESC. Okay, when we're looking at ascending, our default thing, nulls are going to come first, special characters, numbers, and letters. This is SQL's attempt to provide a human order to things. All right, there's your simple descending. Normally, we just put order by vendor name, but we want to see it from last to first. Some people whose last names begin with Z would very much appreciate this. So that's the code. Notice it's the same query. Nice, pretty vendor city state with some special characters put in. So it looks nice from vendors. Order by vendor name descending. Now, so far, up until this point, we'd always just put one order by. But you can put as many as you want, and they're done from left to right. In other words, it's going to sort by vendor state first, and then vendor city second, and then vendor name last. And that may be important for some business reason. And that's the way you're going to need to code it. Uh, order by can use all of the fields that are defined in the select phrase. Remember that. Order by can use all of the fields that are defined in the, in the select phrase. Now, one thing to note here is vendor city, vendor state, vendor SIP, and the select are renamed as an address header of address. We can't use address in an order by. We can use the individual fields, but not the derived fields, not the as fields. And we're going to see that's an important rule to remember because select from where order by are a block of code that fully executes before some other stuff we're going to start hanging on it next week. All right. So at the time that select from where order by completes, address exists as a single field that contains, say, Phoenix, Arizona 85062 at the time that it completes, when our interim table is completely created. But the order by is a, a default part of the select phrase. So you can't use address until the order by completes. So just keep that little rule in mind. It's a tweak we'll have to deal with. Now, it's going to make a liar out of me right away because uh, it's just select from where and transact SQL. In MySQL and Oracle, what I just said is perfectly true in ours. We can use address. My my bad. Sorry. Now here's another one. We can use an expression. Order by vendor contact name plus vendor vendor last name plus vendor first name. There's all sorts of things you could do with order by. The other thing is that you could do it by column positions. How many columns did we end up with? Vendor name, address. One, two. Order by two, comma, one. This one is a little wonky. It's a little harder to read. You got to understand that. It would probably be better to just say, hey, order by vendor name, comma, address. This one reversed. 
but you can do it by column positions if you would like. Always remember that you're coding for the dumbest person on your team, so use the field names if you can, even though this one will work perfectly fine. Now, here's the other thing. Uh, with the order by, it has its own syntax. We're selecting vendor ID, invoice total from invoices. We're ordering by invoice total descending. And then it does some other things. Offset zero rows. In other words, start at the beginning and fetch the first five rows only. Because remember, select from where creates that data set. Order by is now reorganizing that database to put it on the uh, data set to put it on the screen. So we actually have a form table that contains two fields that order by is operating on. It says offset is how far do I want to start down in my list. Offset zero would start with the first one and then fetch the first five rows out of however many were returned, which if you did vendor ID and invoice total, I think you're going to get 114 rows total. But the order by is only going to limit it to five. Which one would be simpler? Select top five vendor ID invoice total from invoices order by invoice total descending or what you see on the screen. That's a fist fight all by itself, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, I think this top five is a better way to do it. Some people do it this way. You will see this out in the world. Uh, given a maintenance window where I didn't have anything else to do, I would go fix this one and change it to top five on the select phrase. To me, that's clear, but it's up to you. Now, here's another one where they're using that offset to actually move down a little bit. All right, instead of offset zero and starting at the top, they're taking the interim table created by the select from where on this slide, moving down 10 rows and saying, that's my starting point, and then fetch the next 10 rows. So they're actually pulling the next one, 11 through 20. And that's one way to use the offset. You actually use uh, this offset more in procedures and functions, which we're not going to do for a little while, because you can do it programmatically. Add 10 each time. Just put 10 on a screen, 10 on the next screen, 10 on the next screen, uh, and kind of control your page flow a little bit. Whereas with top 5 or top 10, you can't do that. So we'll take a look at that further down the road. All right, uh, the last four slides, I don't believe there's any of that in your current assignment for this week, but there's good things to know because they're going to come back up again next week when we start doing queries with multiple tables and with subqueries. Now, this video will be all placed on the screen right above your SQL convert codes. Uh, notice here's your convert codes that we talked about before. I've actually given you a simpler page rather than the SQL documentation. This one from W3 Schools is pretty good and gives them to you in a, in a prettier, easier to read list, a little less nerdy. But I will place this a link to this video right above SQL convert codes. And we will be back at school on Tuesday, at least looking at the forecast on my phone. Shouldn't be any problem. And we'll answer any questions left over from chapter three. Hopefully, all of you have finished your exam. I have not looked today, but that exam is due tomorrow. Don't forget to use the review guide, and we will see you on Tuesday.